previously on The Fan of History. A major revolt broke out in the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which is on its deathbed. So, what happened in the 740s BC? Well, I'm gonna talk to you about what happened to the Neo-Assyrian Empire after 745 BC, but to fully comprehend the gravity of the situation, you should probably watch all the videos of the Neo-Assyrian Empire playlist. So, there is this major revolt in Assyria. It's centered around the capital itself, and the sources all go silent, so we know nothing what happened in this revolt, but we can deduce a few things. But first, let's check in with the two most powerful men in the empire before this revolt and see how they are doing when the sources come back in 745. First we have the king, Ashenirar V, and I spoiled this last time, but the king is dead. And the dynasty of the Agassites has ended. This is a 1000 year old dynasty. But who killed the king? Shamshi Ilu, the powerful field marshal who has commanded the army of the Assyrians through the reign of four kings. He has been around for perhaps more than 50 years, even 60 years. But the old field marshal who had made more monuments than most Assyrian kings has gone to meet the god of war in the afterlife. And who killed him? Look at this man. Look at him carefully. It's not a watch. I find it pretty hard to contain myself now because this guy should be mentioned in the same breath as the great generals of history. He is about to do so many fantastic things. So I don't know where to begin, but I'm going to show you a couple of pictures just to make you understand how big this is. This is the empire that just almost died. This was the situation in 746 BC. Enemies all around. And you can see the great outline is the shadow of the empire of Shalmaneser III's uh, nation. And now only the heartland is controlled by the Assyrians. But in a few years it will look like this. Babylon, Urartu, Elam, Egypt, Israel, Judah, etc. They will all be conquered by the Assyrians. Look at this again. Big, big empire. Giganormous empire. And it's all because of this man. There are great things ahead. The Assyrians will invent many things and you'll be amazed at what they invented. They will make an army that could just crush the army of Ashurnasirpal II and not even uh, break a sweat. You will see an empire twice the size of Shalmaneser III's empire. In fact, you have seen nothing yet. All these episodes, they are just the early Neo-Assyrian Empire. This is what people talk about when they talk about the Neo-Assyrian Empire. This is the empire. We are going to meet four great kings who are on the level of Ashurnasirpal II or Shalmaneser III. You're going to meet Sargon, Sennacherib, Esarhaddon. And the scholar king, which you see, this is his statue in San Francisco today. But none of those four great kings are equal to our man, this guy. So most things Roman and Persian, most things empire, comes not only from the Assyrians, but from this very person. You have heard, uh, he has many names, but you have heard me mentioning as the... Assyrian. Well, that was the last time I did that. So who was this guy? Who dared end the dynasty of the Abbasides? And who would take out the mighty Shamshi Ilu who has survived so much? You have met him before in our story. And he seems to have been Pulu, the governor of Kala. But how did a mere governor, even if the governor of the capital, manage to win the civil war and kill all his enemies. The sources are gone and the general consensus is hey, we just don't know. He was just really good at making rebellion. But I have a theory and I will return to it many times. Remember, last time we talked about Nabonassar, the king of Babylon. He was a Sumerian and broke a long line of 
Chaldean rule over Babylon. I think Nabonassar and Pulu made a deal. So he had Babylonian support for his bid for power. Just like in the civil war of the 820s, the Babylonian king interfered in Assyrian politics. And there will be evidence for this later in this very show. I think there is an alliance between uh, Pulu and Nabonassar, just like the alliance that existed before between Nabo Apluidina and Shalmaneser III. And the Assyrian will honor this alliance, just like the great kings of old. But did he really end the ancient dynasty? Well, if you ask him, he will say, oh, well, I wasn't. I didn't. I was one of them. So he will claim to be an Abbaside, and nobody dared question him. But do you remember how Shalmaneser III talked about himself? He said, I am Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, king of the universe, son of Ashunasipal, king of Assyria, king of the universe, grandson of Tukulti Ninurta, etc., etc. So the Assyrians talked a lot about their forefathers and the honor of their father and grandfather, etc. But the Assyrian will mention his forefathers very rarely, extremely rarely, suspiciously rarely. He will make two claims, and we shall look at these claims. So there is an inscribed brick from Asher, where he says that he is the son of Adad Nirari, the king of Assyria. And this is probably Adad Nirari III. This is not unreasonable. All the previous, king have been, <laughs> previous kings oh, in the interval has been the sons of Adad Nirari. And he could have been a very young son of Adad Nirari. That would put him at about 40 years of age, which seems very likely. So it's not unreasonable. But there is also a king's list on which it is claimed that he is the son of Ashur Nirari, the king of Assyria. Apparently Ashur Nirari V, the king that just died. But in another place, in a third place, he's mentioned as the offspring of Baltil. And Baltil is an ancient quarter in the city of Ashur. So offspring of Baltil will be something that later Assyrian kings will use just because the Assyrian used it. But uh, I am quite convinced that this guy is no Abbaside. He made a clever plan. He revolted. He took power in Assyria with the help of the Babylonians. And this is a dangerous example for future ambitious Assyrians. Meet him. Here he is, Tiglath Pileser III. That's a name he will claim as a king of Assyria. We did mention Tiglath Pileser II in the 10th century BC, and Tiglath Pileser I was a very powerful king of the Middle Assyrian Empire. The name is westernized, and his real name is Tukulti Apil Isara. My trust is in the son of Ishara. And Ashara is probably the Ashara, the great temple of Ashur in the city of Ashur. So I have a lot of things to say about this guy. I don't know how long this episode will be. It will probably be really long. But I will alternate between talking about him as the Assyrian, as Tiglath Pileser III, TP3, or even Pulu, because his old name will become useful once again later. Yep, we have to talk about this guy and all the things that he did. And that will take many episodes, but we have to cover the 740s in this episode. So we'll talk about the wars for 745 to 740 BC. Remember, there has not been any Assyrian conquest for a very long time, but there will be. But first we have to talk about the ways he changed the empire for the better. So uh, buckle in, because uh, I just spent 17 slides telling you his name. He changed the Neo-Assyrian complete, uh, Empire completely. First he brought back good old policies, uh, all of the policies of Ashur Nasipal II. He uh, made deportations. He deported during his reign 260,000 people. And while Ashurnasipal II deported a lot of people, he took them mainly as slave labor. But uh, Tiglath Pileser will deport people from one end of the empire to the other. So he will take all the able fighting men from one place, bring them out so that they can't revolt in their homeland, and bring them to a contested border so they have to defend Assyria. And this is a policy that many empires will use after him. He also introduced eunuchs as governors. I think this was the idea all the time with the empire, that 
governors should be eunuchs, but this had fallen into disuse, but it's brought back. So many governors are eunuchs so that they can't get children and they can't become a powerful dynasty that can compete with the king. Tiglath Pileser also saw the problem with vassal states. He will acquire new vassal states for the empire and he will rekindle old vassal state statuses. But if there is problem, he will make them provinces. He will deport their fighting men and he will put Assyrians in charge. But the most important thing he had to do right now in the middle of the revolt was to ensure that the empire wouldn't collapse under its own weight again. And the way to do that was to contain the power of the nobles. During the interval, the nobles had been running amok, destroying the empire from within. And he couldn't just kill off the nobles and just use eunuchs because he needed the nobles. So what he did was that he introduced the dual position. So every important position had two guys. So one of them couldn't revolt without the other. And the most, uh, this is just like the Romans did it. And the most important position in the kingdom was the Tutano, the field marshal. You, you saw how Shamshi Ilo abused his power. So there were two Tutanos and they were randomly called the Tutano of the left and the Tutano of the right. So from now on there will be two field marshals in charge of the Neo-Assyrian army. The number of provinces was increased radically because if provinces were smaller they uh, stood less chance of revolting and becoming countries in their own. So there were 12 provinces I think before the... Uh, there were 12 provinces at some point, I think it was right before this. But now we have 80 provinces at the end of Tiglath Pileser's reign. There was also the first uh, secret police, pretty much an administrative group that reported directly to the king. It wasn't very secret at this point, but it, there will be a secret police later. And they, they were in charge of inspecting the provinces and the loyalty of the governors, reporting directly to TP3. Also, and this is the first, I think, he put the crown prince into charge of administration of the empire while he was away on campaign. Because Tiglath Pileser will go on much longer campaigns than earlier Assyrian kings did. And then somebody has to be in charge. And the crown prince is Ululaya. He's probably around 20-ish at this point. And uh, don't worry, there will be, never be a king Ululaya of the Assyrian Empire. So he finds a new name for his chosen son, which was probably his firstborn. And he looks into Assyrian history and finds the most successful son of a powerful Assyrian king. So he will name his son Shalmaneser V. And we'll talk more about him later because he will indeed become the king of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, Tiglath Pileser III also built a new palace at Kala. This is the central palace and we have a lot of things to say about that and his other building projects. And we'll do that in the 720s. So now Tiglath Pileser has sorted out the administration of the empire. Now it was time to shape up the army. The army was the best army in the world, or at least it used to be the best army in the world. But he would make it much better. First, he introduced army boots. And you can see them to the right from an actual Assyrian relief. Uh, earlier, the Assyrian soldiers used to walk in sandals, and that was pretty inconvenient, for example, when you campaigned against Urartu, because they lived in high, cold mountains. And you don't want to wear sandals there, but now they have army, bo army boots and they can walk much further and don't get cold. But that's not all he did. He did a lot of things, and it probably requires a separate video. Because this is the army that will go on now for 130 years. And I should probably do a video about it like I did on the early Neo-Assyrian army. If you think that is a good idea, say so in the comments. Tiglath Pileser III introduced a standing army. A professional army that never demobilized. So now the army can... Be supported for the homeland. It doesn't need to go home. It doesn't need to go back to the farms. So you can be on campaign all the time. And he will go on campaigns that last for years. And no Assyrian king before him did this. They just returned home during the winter. The soldiers had to go back to their farms. 
that these soldiers never go back to their farms because they have no farms. They are professional soldiers. And the range of the Assyrian Iron Fist can now be projected much further than it could be before. So he is kind of the Marius of the Assyrians, but is this the invention of professional standing armies or is it not? There are hints that, for example, Sargon of Akkad had the standing army, but uh, I don't really know, so I will have to look into that further. If you know of an example of standing army that is earlier than this, please tell me in the comments. So, um, he seldom put anyone else in charge of the professional royal army, but after his reign it will happen. So there will be Turtanos that will be in charge of the professional royal army. There were a great use of auxiliaries. Over time the Assyrians themselves uh, moved were mainly charioteers and cavalry. But Tiglath Pileser could use foreign troops very efficiently. And the Itua, this tribe that had been so troublesome, remember all the fights against the Itua in the interval? They were made a Gurkha-like force, so they were like special troops for the Assyrians and found pride in this. So they, they the trouble with the Itua ended this way. And this army, this extremely powerful army, could walk right over the army of Ashur Nasipal II. And that is quite an achievement because technology hasn't improved that much. But this is an experienced fighting force of professional soldiers. And when people talk about the Assyrian army and the Assyrian warfare, it's the warfare of this army they talk about. There were probably plenty more reforms. And I think I will use TP3 as a peg to hang things on. So who invented that? It was probably TP3. This is the way the Romans used their legendary kings that I'm not talking about. But uh, yeah, there were probably much more reforms than this. If you know of a reform that Tiglath Pileser did, please tell me in the comments. So it's time for the Assyrian Empire to rise from the ashes. Finally, but first we have to talk about the sources because the number of sources increase, but they are not necessarily better than the old sources. We have royal inscriptions like before, we have chronographic text, we have letters, we have legal and administrative documents, as well as the sculpture reliefs of his palace. But the annals of the Assyrian are in a very bad state of preservation and they are currently working on restoring them. So we might soon know more about Tiglath Pileser III. And there are gaps in our knowledge of him. But look at this image of the Assyrian going to war. There are people on spikes there. Yes, there is going to be uh, Assyrian massacres again. And it's been the massacres, this treatment of their enemies is what made people fear the Assyrians. But you haven't really seen them since the day of Shalmaneser III. But now he is going to go Assyrian on people again. In 745 BC, the Assyrian invades Babylonia. And I think this is to pay back his debt to his friend Nabonassar. So the campaign is a massive victory. And especially for Nabonassar, the restless tribes of the north are crushed by Tiglath Pileser III. The cities of Dur, Kurigalsu and Sippar are uh, defeated. Several troublesome Aramean tribes are crushed, such as the Adil, the Dunanu, Hamranu and Rabilu. There is a new city built and populated with these prisoners from this war. And after this war is done, Nabonassar is secure on his Babylonian throne. So secure, in fact, then, that he could actually leave his throne to his son, which didn't happen very often in Babylon. Uh, some people, uh, or most of the books I've read, misinterpret this campaign and think it's a failure because Tiglath Pileser never fought Nabonassar. But I am telling you that he had no motivation to do this. He was following the deal he made with the Babylonian king. And this was just what Ashurnasipal and Chalmaneser did in their day. Because the Assyrians really have respect for the city dwellers of Babylon and they really hate the tribal peoples of Babylon. But regarding the Sumerian city people of Babylon, the Assyrians count them as brothers. 
while the Babylonians probably count the Assyrians as uh, their backwater cousins, even when they have a great empire. In 744 BC, Tiglath Pileser goes on a great campaign, and when you read about this guy, people tend to gloss over this campaign, but I find it fantastic. He turns east into the troublesome Sagros Mountains. Remember, the last war of the interval, the last war of Ashenerari V, was against Namri, the kingdom of the Kassites. It's Namar on this map, it's to the lower left, right at the edge of the Sagros Mountains. But uh, yeah, he invades this area, he just overruns Namri, he overruns Bit Sati, Bit Abdadini, Bit Kapsi, these are tribes. The city of Nikur is captured and made a capital of a new province. The whole area is conquered, except the Bit Kapsi, because their king, Batanu, is allowed to rule as an Assyrian vassal king. He also takes Bit Kabman and Parsua and form them into Assyrian provinces. And this is an area that has been giving Assyria trouble for nearly 100 years and now it's just pacified. But he's not done yet. How long ago was it then since somebody added a province to Assyria? But he's doing it many times. So Elippi, this powerful kingdom uh, dependent on Elam to the southeast, the ruler just sees this happening and uh, he decides, I ah, yield. So he sends tribute to Tiglath Pileser III before Tiglath Pileser even has the time to go into Elippi. So Elippi yields to the Assyrians and the kingdom of Mana under Iransu decides to do the same and submits to Assyrian rule. So suddenly a whole big chunk of the Sagros Mountains is pacified and under Assyrian control. This is further than the Assyrians have ever conquered before. And now Tiglath Pileser even has a direct border with Elam. The Medes, these powerful mountain people, they flee to the mountains and they are not conquered at this time. But the fact that Dalta of Ilippi and Iranse of Mania is Assyrian vassals from this point will help Sargon II immensely uh, in the near future. Okay, after that campaign, crushing everyone in the east, the Assyrian goes to Syria. Remember, this area has not felt the Assyrian Iron Fist since the days of Adad Nirari III, and there is an anti Assyrian alliance. It was formed by Sarduri II of Urartu, but some sources claim that Matiel, the king of Arpad, is the leader of this alliance. Karkemish, to the right on the map, the ancient Neo Hittite city. It might be in the alliance, it's unclear, but we know that Gurgum, Kumuk, conquered in the last episode by the Urartians, Urartu and Arpad are in this alliance. And there's even an Urartian army in Kumuk, right to the north. Beco probably because Sarduri II just forced Kumuk into vassalage. But instead of waiting for this alliance to do something against the Syrians, Tiglath Pileser just invades Syria. And on the way, he passes the middle Euphrates where a lot of older vassal kingdoms has defected and stopped paying tribute but as soon as the Assyrian shows up they're just hey you're here that's great here's our tribute hey don't beat us so he just conquers the whole area around the middle Euphrates by just walking through it but here he comes up against the great conqueror of Urartu Remember, we talked a lot about him last episode, so all the people he vanquished. This is Sarduri II, the great king of Urartu, and he's here with his royal army. So we are in for a heavyweight main event. It's the Assyrian versus Sarduri II. And it should have been an epic battle, and I don't think Shamshi Ilu would have won this time. I think Saduri II remembered his fight with Shamshi Ilu, and he was now prepared to beat an Assyrian army which had the capacity of Shamshi Ilu's army, but TP3 is not Shamshi Ilu, and he absolutely crushes the Urartian army. So Saduri has to flee to the mountains with the remains of his army, and Kumuk immediately yields 
and becomes a vassal state to Assyria saying, oh, the Urachian forced us to do this, but we were always on the Assyrian side. And Tiglath-Pileser says, okay, well, good, now you're Assyrian vassals. Who else is opposing me? And it turns out that Arpad is still opposing him, despite the fact that all their allies are gone from the area. This city-state stands against the Assyrian. So Arpad refuses to yield, despite the fact that the royal professional army of Tiglath-Pileser III is standing outside its gates. But they have high walls, they have good supplies, and they will never yield to Assyria again. They have resisted Assyrian domination for so long, and this, this is their stand. So the city is besieged, and the Assyrians have good siege knowledge, but this city is well fortified, and tiglath pileser can't take the city. And the Arpadians are like, haha, when winter comes, they will return home and will be safe. But tiglath pileser III never goes home with unfinished business. So he is besieging this city over the winter, but he is kind of bored, so he has to do something else at the same time. So he leaves a, a force besieging the city, and then he marches south. It is unclear exactly which year this happened, but uh, and it's also possible that there was an anti-Israelite party in Israel that uh, invited Tiglath Pileser III to come south, because the Bible records a pro-Egyptian and pro-Assyrian party in Israel. And uh, kings, the Book of Kings says, and Pul, king of the Assyrians, came into the land. Uh, the Assyrian is now marching through lands that have given Assyria so much trouble. Remember all the struggles of Damascus, the battle of Karkar, etc. But Tiglath-Pileser is here and there is no resistance. So Damascus yields and pay tributes. Judah yields long before Tiglath-Pileser even gets there. And King Menahem of Israel, remember him. He's a powerful warlord. He has massacred people. He has seized the power of Israel. And when he sees the army of Tiglath-Pileser III, he knows exactly what he's up against. And he does the only reasonable thing. He yields. So he says, Israel is at your service, my king. But Tiglath-Pileser wants tribute and he requires 37 tons of silver. So Menahem has to turn his terrorizing ways onto his own people, forcing all the wealthy men in the kingdom to give him silver. Uh, all the mighty and rich men has to pay 0 0.6 kilograms of silver for this tribute. And that implies that there were 60,000 mighty and rich men in Israel at the time, which is not bad. But there were the golden age of Jeroboam II quite recently. And that golden age has now ended because the gold and the silver is leaving Israel and going to Tiglath-Pileser III. And I think Menahem did the right thing because he had no chance to resist the Assyrian army. And Samaria was not as well fortified as Arpad was. So Tiglath-Pileser looks, he has three new vassal kingdoms. Uh, so then he goes back to the siege of Arpad. 741 BC, we have the eponym year of Bel Karam Bella Usur. I mentioned this guy earlier because he built a city to himself where the king had no power. I think he has given this up. And I, I was surprised to find that he wasn't dead. But I think he must have been a personal friend of the Assyrian and been early on his side. Because he was the palace herald in Kala. And Tiglath Pileser was the governor of Kala. So maybe they were friends. Because this guy is still around and he's still the palace herald. And he's working under the crown prince, Shalmaneser V then in Kala. Administering the empire while the king is away besieging Arpad. And Arpad still resists. The siege will last for three years. And, but the Assyrian will not let Arpad go. And Arpad will not surrender. They have taken their stand. They will fight until they die. In 740 BC, Uzziah, the king of Judah, dies. Remember, Uzziah was hidden away with his leprosy, but he was still ruling together with his son, 
but now he finally dies. And that ends a reign that has lasted from 791 BC. So Isaiah ruled Judah during the Golden Age, but at his death, Judah was just another Assyrian vassal state. So in 740 BC, after three years, Arpad finally falls to the Assyrian army. And Tiglas Pileser III shows that he's a true Assyrian king because he massacres the poor inhabitants of Arpad down to the last person. Maybe even builds a tower of heads. There's flaying, people are put on stakes, the city is razed to the ground, the area is conquered, it becomes an Assyrian province. Uh, there is uh, the remains of Arpad could be seen at a place called Tel Rifat today, and the walls are still eight meters high after three thousand years. The anti-Assyrian alliance has now been crushed, but Urartu is still powerful, and Sarduri II is hiding behind his mountain fortresses that has protected him from Assyrian power for hundred years. Syria is in shock after this. They have been left to their own devices ever since the days of Adad Nirari III, and they have not seen Assyrian power like this since Ashurnasipal II. And there were massacres in Arpad. And Assyrian massacres at this point is just a legend. But now the Phoenicians and the city-states of Syria has to consider that, well, this could happen to us if we resist. So what's the plan of Tiglath Pileser III? Are we next on the list? The Phoenicians are used to being able to pay off the Assyrians and actually earn money on them because the Phoenicians supply the powerful empires with luxury goods from the Mediterranean. But they look at this guy and think, what is going to happen next? And the Assyrian will take no breaks. He will. He knows that Urartu is still around. And uh, look at the things he did. It's, it's, it's just been five years since he took power. And he has extended the empire so much already. The empire was almost dead. I'd like to argue that this, the empire he took over was weaker than the empire that Ashurnasipal II or Shalmanis III began with. And this is all he has done. And the list will get even longer in the 730s BC. So next time we'll go to the 730s BC. The Greeks will start colonizing for real. And the Assyrian will conquer some more. And the Spartans will fight the longest war in their history. I do this uh, Decade Reports weekly. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. You can support the show at patreon.com. That would be awesome if you did. But whatever way you choose uh, to show me your support, I will be grateful. Just commenting on the YouTube videos make me really happy. Because I mainly do this thing for fun. And uh, yeah, it's fun to talk about history. Thank you for watching.